Heva, I've invited you onto the channel today because I know that a lot of women suffer from migraine. And I know that you have uh, specialized in this in your pharmacy practice. So can you just give us a little bit of an overview of what does migraine look like in society? How many people are we really talking about that suffer from migraine right now? Thank you for inviting me, Lindsay. It's a, it's a pleasure to be on your, um, on your channel. It's, uh, it's, it's very refreshing to see um, all, all the great subjects that you're bringing um, to, to practitioners and to patients at the same time. Thank you very much for the invitation. Of course. So yeah, I'm migraine. Why migraine? Um, migraine is one of these conditions that are always miss, um, like they're mistaken for just a headache. And when someone says, I have a migraine, you, you, you think, oh, they, they must have a headache. And that's a totally um, misunderstood condition. It's a neurological disorder. Um, migraine, one of the symptoms is a headache, but it's not just a headache. It's much more than a headache. Um, it, it Prevalence, it's, it's really prevalent. It's something that uh, one of every four households in Canada have someone that lives with migraine. Mm. Um, in terms of, you said women. So yes, women are more uh, affected by the condition than men. And that might be due to, um, um, you know, hormonal changes. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the evolution of that. Why more women than men? But men also get migraine. Um, it is dismissed as not a very important uh, condition um, and historically because it's a women condition there's a lot of oh maybe it's the way they perceive pain maybe it's just a headache and you know it's an upset stomach at the same time and that led to years and years of um, people living with uh, migraine being ignored um, it is more prevalent than diabetes epilepsy and asthma all put together Right. Wow. So, but we don't hear about it as, as we hear about all these conditions, you know, not to um, make any condition less than mm -hmm. another condition, but it's really common. It's not something that is, that happens uh, rarely. Uh, one of every five women get migraine at one stage of her life. If we look at children, uh, it's 10% prevalence. One wow. of every 10 children get uh, migraine. And um, sometimes it's mistaken. Oh, they have a little bit of an upset stomach. They have a headache. How often have we heard children say, I have my head hurts and I have my tummy hurts. And then, you know, they might throw up and they sleep and the next day they're okay. Most of the time, if the parent does live with migraine, they will know that this is a, a migraine attack. If not, a lot of times it, it goes unnoticed. Now, at, uh, when they reach the age of uh, at puberty, these 10%, 25% of them, women get 25% of them start to having migraine, to start to having migraine. And um, only one, uh, only 8% of them. So obviously there's now a hormonal, um, um, you know, influence of why more women get it than men in childhood, both uh, boys and girls get migraine. Now, when there are uh, changes in, in life, uh, there are triggers, of course, things that make it more likely for you to have a migraine. And there are also, um, uh, you know, changes in terms of um, uh, you know, if you're on a medication, there's primary headache, there's secondary headache. But if we're talking about migraine per se, migraine is very common. It's it's very, um, it, it's all around us. We tend not to see it as much as we should be. And it is portrayed, unfortunately, in the media as something that people say, I have a headache to get out of you know, you know, having to do things like an excuse. And you see it all the time um, portrayed as just an excuse instead of, you know, a, 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 a neurological disorder. That's a great overview. And for those who might be wondering or might be a little bit unclear, because I think society is of somewhat unclear on what is a headache versus what is a migraine. These are two very different issues. Is that right? 
Yes, um, um, a headache is pain that can be in different parts of the head, could be both sides, could be on one side, could be um, um, related to um, things like dehydration or stress or it, all sorts of different, different things. A migraine has specific features that put it under migraine in terms of diagnosis. So, um, one of like you need to have two of the three that I'm going to mention. The first thing is photophobia, and photophobia meaning that people become too sensitive to um, to light. Uh, one of the things that people always think it's only on one part of the of of the head, or it's only on one side of the head. That's not necessarily um, um, migraine. Oh, it okay. could be also also on both sides of the head. Photophobia, so you cannot tolerate. Uh, light and most of us if you have a headache usually you become a little bit sensitive to, mm -hmm. to light. but a lot of migraine patients even when they do not have a headache they are also sensitive to to the sun or to uh, excessive light or flickering lights and maybe even that light can bring on a headache for them okay. so photosensitivity um, um, maybe an upset stomach we know that there's also a link between migraine and the gut there are certain receptors that are targeted by medications that are actually, uh, if you, you target these receptors, you do have an impact. And we're going to talk about it on, on managing migraine. So mm -hmm. nausea, vomiting, very common, absolutely uh, misunderstood and missed again. So um, if you are diagnosed with migraine and you go to your family doctor and you say, I have a, a migraine headache and you are diagnosed with migraine, they will give you something for your headache, but they always miss to give you something for your stomach. People end up using something like ginger or you know gravel over the counter or anything over the counter to try and help them. But actually that's a big part of migraine itself. And sometimes it is just as disabling for them. And the third thing is that you feel like the duration, it could be anywhere from four hours to 72 hours to so three days of a continuous headache. That is one of the diagnostic criteria, but it could be as little as four um, um, hours. Um, the last bit is around, um, you will feel that you need to sleep, that you cannot stay awake. After a migraine attack, you feel that you cannot be in an area where there is light. Um, a lot of times you cannot even hear noise. Um, Interestingly, even one of these, uh, the, the signs that are very weird is also you cannot uh, be exposed to, to smells as well. So any smell might also make your migraine worse or your headache worse. So you feel that you need to go to sleep and then um, you cannot, um, it's disabling. It's one of these conditions. A lot of my patients are disabled because of the condition. So then we say, how often do you get it in a month? If you get it- right. Uh, one to six days, it's called episodic. So it, it happens one to six uh, days every month. And uh, there's again, a misconception around, is this number of days or is this actual migraine attacks? It's number of days. So it affects you six days in a month. You will go through um, a migraine, either one episode twice a month, each lasting three days. As I said, it's four to 72 hours. But overall, if it affects you, one to six days, that's roughly 85% of people who live with migraine go in, in that category. So that is limited time. They feel a little bit uh, tired. They feel they cannot, they have to be in a dark room. And most of the time they manage this with over-the-counter medication. Then we have high frequency uh, episodic. And these are people who have seven to 14 days in a month where they wow. are living with a condition. Um, again, the, the, the numbers are um, not, again, the, the maximum is, or the higher, highest number is in that, in the first category, but this one is also a lot of patients. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's around 15%, 14.5% or something like that, are those living with eight to 14. Now, a lot of the people, move on in the continuum to have something called chronic migraine. And these mm -hmm. are people who are living with migraine for 15 days or more a month. And you would think, how can someone live with 15 migraine days a month? Yeah, exactly. 5% uh, 
of, um, uh, of, of people living with migraine. And it's roughly 1% of all people living in, like if, if we take Canada, you would have roughly half a million people um, exposed to that chronic migraine more than 14 days or more than 15 days a month. That's a huge number of patients living with a condition. Mm -hmm. so one to 2% of general population in any country would have um, um, chronic migraine. 80% of these are women. So more disabling to women than it is to men. Um, and not to this, this um, again, not to discount, the experience of men with migraine is also not encouraging at all because mm -hmm. it doesn't jump um, to the diagnosis. Like you wouldn't think of a man with migraine. You are more likely to think of a woman with a migraine before you think of a man with a migraine. That's so true. Yeah. they are dismissed, they're also, um, uh, um, you know, totally played down as let's look at other things. It's just a headache, just as much for them. And I'm, I'm going to say, basically, from my patients, I see more men saying, no, no, it's not a migraine. They are also more in denial because of that stigma around it's a it's like a women condition. It's it, men don't get migraine. They get headaches, but they don't get migraine. Very interesting. I, yeah. um, so so it, it, this is the continuum. This is this is how prevalent it is. This is how how many people live with a condition and how. Um, and the signs and symptoms. Um, of course, you need a, a diagnosis from a doctor. Yeah. Uh, there are red flags that when in our practice, if we have someone coming in with a, um, with a migraine or coming to ask us for migraine recommendation, we number one, always ask, do you have a diagnosis? Because you don't want to miss any of the red flags. Because it could and be other do, things, yeah. Mm -hmm. It could be other things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so... So when someone uh, is, is suffering from migraine and they have a diagnosis, um, you mentioned aura. Okay. So what could, what does aura look like? Because I've heard that people can often feel like a migraine is coming on without having these flashing lights. So are there different signs and symptoms? Because you said that it's important that people do treat say um, nausea or things like that almost preemptively sometimes. So uh, what are some of the signs and symptoms that someone is maybe about to suffer a migraine attack? There are, uh, aura is misunderstood as people mm -hmm. see, you know, sometimes it, people think it's very specific that you see different colors and it's one of the signs of aura. So there is a visual aura. It could be um, um, in, in, in um, spots or even, uh, spots that are that are in in or zigzags in like front floating. of your eyes or even or floating or whatever but it also could be partial loss of vision like you cannot see at this uh, on the side of your of your eyes mm -hmm. and it could be also um uh, you cannot uh formulate words that's that's a form of aura there's also that aura that you do not have the same um, you're not able to um, uh, to be coordinated where you have weakness on on one side of your body and people living with migraine tend to start to to link this so it happens before a, um, a a migraine it doesn't happen not everybody gets an aura so that's another misconception people tell you I get patients who tell me I don't have the real aura uh, I don't have the real migraine I have a different one I don't get an aura and they think that everybody needs to get an aura no it, it doesn't necessarily I think only 60 percent get an aura and the aura as I said cannot only be visual where you have changes in vision or flickering lights or um, changes in colors or or getting that partial um, loss of vision or any of that could be also different types and patients tend to link it because it is it, it happens before a headache and then the headache hits uh, it could be as short as five minutes it, it doesn't need to be a long time but it could last also a little bit longer than that and as you said there are different 
um, different things that happen. Now, in terms of treating an aura, there are no treatments for an aura. Mm. But uh, one of the things is that if you know that you have an aura, then it means that you know that a migraine is coming, which means it gives you the opportunity to actually treat early, which is something that we always advise people living with migraine is number one rule, treat early. A lot of people say, oh, I have to wait to find out if it's a migraine or not. And then it becomes too late until they cannot tolerate it anymore. Then if you know, if you get that small sign, although it's it's distressing although sometimes it's as i said it might last a long time it might be very uncomfortable disabling if you cannot see or if you have weakness but um, i would say that it's a good opportunity for us to take it to the next part which is treat early um, a migraine attack is coming you can treat early because you have that sign happening that's great. And how about, I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the physiology behind migraine. So when a person is, is getting aura and they end up with a migraine, what is happening in our brains? I know that there's some trigeminal nerve involvement. Um, could you just explain that a little bit to us? Because it's this, it's this strange phenomenon that causes a lot of suffering, but what is actually happening in our body when this occurs? Well, interestingly enough, it's not until now, there's not one uh, pathophysiology that I can tell you, this is what happens Mm -hmm. with everybody. And this has always been the reason why we do not have a a, really a treatment for migraine, because um, different medications that work on different pathways of pain Mm -hmm. might give relief to some uh, people, but it cannot, it possibly does not give relief to others. The best medications that we have work for 50% of people living with migraine. That's the best. If you have the best results, it only works for 50% Mm. and uses 50% of your, um, um, uh, you know, 50 to sometimes some studies show even 60% reduction in the number of migraine attacks. So because of that, um, very um, uh, a complex mm-hmm. uh, condition. Mm-hmm. It's not as simple. Uh, and there are, that's why there's a lot of treatments that we have out there that do give results, but we don't know why or how. Uh, we have anti epileptic medications, we have blood pressure medications, um, antidepressants. We have the CGRPs that are uh, monoclonal antibodies now that are available. They work on different receptors to do different things. We know there's serotonin. We know there's like we know that uh, um, different receptors are involved in the body, and you know there is no real. It's it's there's a lot of research, but mm-hmm. there's no mm-hmm. answer to what really happens in an attack. Yeah, and I think that what you're getting at is that we have a lot of treatments but these don't always, these often don't work in a lot of people, like you said. And so it's a little bit of trial and error trying to figure out what works, right? And we don't have a cure for migraine, right? So we have to keep using kind of what's available and what the latest research is is showing us. Um, And specifically about women, Heba, why do women suffer more from migraine? So what is the link between say estrogen? I think there might be some serotonin involvement as well with migraine. Um, What is the, why do women suffer more from this? And what is the, the, the physiology behind even our hormones as far as that goes? So there is a link between hormonal changes in women and mm-hmm. the, and migraine. Um, we know that um, we're, we're going to talk, we started talking about aura, so we will talk about estrogen and how. Sure. Um, so we know that there is a, um, there's a big, big um, um, number of women who start having um, menstrual migraine. Okay. And menstrual migraine, when you're a teenager, if you have a mig- if you have your period and you have a headache, you think of it as normal and a little bit of an upset stomach because of that cramping that happens, then it, got, it gets um, taken for granted that this happens all the time. It's normal. And sometimes it gets better. Sometimes it gets worse. It depends on the, ch- on the hormonal changes. There is a link between estrogen and the the hormonal changes that happen in the body. Um, We know that women who have migraine um, 
are with aura are more at risk for stroke, for instance. Okay. And we know that if you give them hormonal um, um, uh, contraceptives, contraceptives. Mm -hmm. uh, with estrogen, then that risk triples. Wow. So they are more at risk anyway than the than uh, anybody on an oral contraceptive pill that has estrogen, but it, that that risk triples. So we need, so even if you want to supplement them with estrogen to try and see if they will get better or their migraine get, can get better, you are increasing the risk of a stroke, hmm. and that means that even if this is um, the cause you are not able to provide that as an option for them for treatment. So you have to look at other options for them. And when we're looking at contraception, there's also that, um, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a right, right? You, you need to give contraception, but it needs to be safe as well of and course. safer for these, uh, for these patients. So the recommendation is to only give them progestin only contraceptive pill right. and look at other options to see if, um, um, for for preventive or for relief, if you're going to to give preventive in the form of um, hormonal, there's not. Some people do get better, but the the research is not saying this is what you need to do in terms of hormonal replacement therapy for um, or supplementing or oral contraceptive to uh, help with their migraine. Some people do get better with when they start the pill and their mig migraine gets better, but some women living with migraine cannot get an estrogen. And even if they can, they don't have aura, they might not get better. Again, because of the complexity of this condition. And, and women who suffer, say, from menstrual migraine, are they, are, is their migraine story, I guess, or journey, is it more likely to uh, worsen over time as they get older? Uh, what is, is there a trajectory that is kind of typical for these women or, or is it kind of just very individual? We know that women are um, most affected by migraine throughout their productive years. Oh, so okay. From, from um, puberty, it starts, but it's at, at its worst in their most productive years. That's, that's why they're more disabled by this condition mm -hmm. than um, reproduction. I mean, if you get, if you want to get pregnant, there's no guarantee that you're going to get better or worse mm -hmm. or, or the same. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the medications that are prescribed are not possibly um, uh, safe for pregnancy. So a lot of women are too scared also to go through this. But having said this, um, some um, women get much worse after having a child. Right. So their okay. condition becomes worse after having, um, um, you know, a, a postpartum. And um, that means that there's also that fear. Uh, some of them get better and they say, wow, during my pregnancy, it was heaven. I didn't have any migraine, but some still get migraine attacks during their uh, pregnancy and the treatment options are limited and makes it even more difficult for them. Uh, but there's a lot of medications. We're going to talk about medication options or um, treatment options in, in a while. Um, the, 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 the way that this condition starts, as I said, 85%, 80 to 85% of people still stay in that one to six days. Right. If it's only menstrual migraine, there is a mini prevention protocol that we can give them where they start either a triptan, which is one of the treatment options, two days before the start of that period and continue for a total of five to seven days. And that means that they suppress, you do a mini prevention during their attack. You can also do something like uh, naproxen, which yes. is an anti-inflammatory. Again, you started two days before uh, the start of, uh, of the period and you continue for five to seven days. And that means that their condition stabilizes. Most of the people stay in that, um, uh, you know, one to six days. Then those who do progress, 
there are different reasons why people also progress. There are hormonal changes, there are stresses. So stress is one of these factors that actually uh, can be a trigger. Um, there are different things that we can talk about when we talk about lifestyle changes that can help, but it, life changes. You, you, know, you go through more difficult situations when you're older. You don't exercise as much. Your diet not necessarily is as good. A lot of things happen and might contribute to more migraine, but also if you are taking medication, and you start to get worse and you start to take more medication, there is a condition that is um, um, a medication overuse headache, which is previously, I don't know if you remember years ago, we used to call it rebound headaches, which mm -hmm. means yes. people take medication because they have a headache and then they take, they, if they stop, then they have a headache, then they take again. And then they go into this vicious circle of them needing more and more. And then they can actually go into this chronic or chronification of headache that makes it an everyday thing. Now, remember I said more than 15 days, um, yep. like every other day you have a headache, obviously, up to the full month, people have a headache. Not all of these are migraine. These okay. are headaches with possibly eight days within these extra 15 days that are related to migraine. So okay. it means okay. that um, um, the treatment, the, 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 a lot of people are also hesitant to go on an antidepressant for, for the headaches or a blood pressure medication or um, you know, anti-epileptic. They see the side effects and they go like, no, 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 I will manage it with acute treatment. I'll just take an Advil when I have a headache. And that means that it's not controlled and it starts again, that cycle of it, it starts to get worse and you start to try to medicate and try to use just abortive medications. And that means that they can, um, uh, you know, uh, get converted into this chronic condition. Yeah. And I've heard that the, this chronification that occurs, um, could you explain that a little bit? Because I think that it, it's due to just this constant um, almost overstimulation of certain neural pathways. Is that correct? So what happens is similar to dependence on medications. Mm -hmm. so if you are um, uh, using a, a, a painkiller, and interestingly enough, the, the worst um, uh, cases come from, not interestingly, I would say expectedly, they come from narcotics. So years mm -hmm. ago, if you went to a, a family physician and you said, I have a headache, I cannot live with it, you would possibly get Percocets or you would possibly be given Tylenol 3s or mm -hmm. um, all these medications that Opioids, yeah. or, or whatever, mm -hmm. narcotics or, and, and they would work, they, they possibly will work, but what they will do is they will get you into that chronification because then yeah. you become a little bit more dependent on it. And that withdrawal is a flare up in your headache that is worse even than the one you started with. So you start to use more and more and more and then changes the pathways in, in, you know, in your neurological system. It, yes. it changes the pain pathways that it it's the body starts to ask for more of these medications. It is a dependence of some sort. Um, we see this not only with, um, with um, narcotics, we even see it with coffee, with mm -hmm. caffeine. Mm -hmm. So people who have five, six cups of coffee, I, I did have a patient who told me, no, no, I, I only have seven um, Timmy's, like the large ones. He showed me his cup on... <laughs> <laughs> and he's wow. like, I'm not, I'm not taking any medication. I don't know why I'm having these headaches and I'm cutting down. And then of course he's cutting down. He's having a rebound because he's, he was getting, he was even taking more than seven a day. And wow. then he wow. is also, he has a lot of sugar in there. So guess what? With that, we're getting a little bit of, you know, uh, hypoglycemia every time you stop because the body starts bringing more or yeah, producing yeah. more insulin to clear it. You get into hypoglycemia, which triggers a headache that can, again, um, you know, become uh, yeah, a bigger one if you don't treat it. So yes, there are changes. There are in the, in, in the neurons, there are changes in the, in the pain pathways that are very similar to dependence on, on um, 
narcotics. It happens with Advil, it happens with, um, with naproxen, it happens with acetaminophen, it happens with all these medications. There is though a, a, a cutoff kind of. For triptans, which are these medications are very specific for migraine, if you use them more than 10 days in a month, um, then you are more likely to start having these medication overuse headaches. With um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like Advil or, or naproxen or um, Tylenol or all of, all of these, it's 15 days a month. But if you take anything in combination, again, it brings it down to 10. And if you're taking anything that has narcotics, again, brings it down to 10 days. So the idea is if, if you are needing your medication more than 10 days a month, but something is wrong here you shouldn't be taking pain medication more than one third of your life. Um, there, there are risks, of course, of chronic use of NSAIDs, things like chronic, um, you know, chronic use can cause kidney issues. Uh, it could provide, or it could also induce a stomach ulcer. There, there yeah. are risks uh, associated, but most importantly, if you're in pain one third of your life, something needs to be done. You need to be, doing something or your doctor needs to be prescribing something for you to prevent you from having these migraine attacks to start with. Instead of you treating them, we need to prevent them from happening. I think that's a really good kind of parameter to go by is if you are taking medication for say your headache, if you don't have a diagnosis of migraine, more than one third of the month, more than 10 days out of 30 days in a month, one third of your life, as you said, this is a sign that something is not working, right? And I think that people are hesitant sometimes to reach out to a healthcare professional because of the state of healthcare, because it's not easy in a lot of places to see your doctor. Or if you see a doctor, you might be think, think like, well, I only have a headache. Am I really going to go to the doctor when I could just keep taking Advil? But like you said, even Advil or ibuprofen, these anti-inflammatories have their own risks. They can increase blood pressure. A lot of people don't know that they can also cause, you know, gastric ulcers. They can cause um, acid reflux. I mean, there's a lot of different issues with these that we don't think about. And so you are worth it. You need to seek help from a healthcare professional, right? Um, have, are doctors aware of these treatment protocols? Are they very good at prescribing prophylaxis? What has your experience uh, been? Uh, I think um, because of how complex and how chronic like this is not a condition that it's not a cold you go to the doctor he gives you something and it yeah better and you're done with it I think doctors are um, sometimes overwhelmed by the mm -hmm. condition itself and if you go to the doctor and you say I have a migraine and I also my stomach hurts and also I have let's say I um, you know I have pain on, on, on my side migraine or headache is going to be the last one that they attend to and yeah. people with migraine feel it and and then and, and they like we're going to talk about why um I, I think pharmacists are the best allies for someone living with migraine is because when my patients come to me they say well my doctor i don't think they even know what to do next for me they tell me i'm at my end i've tried everything but then when we go with treatment options they haven't tried everything it's just that they um they are overwhelmed again if if you go to a family doctor most probably you're going with more than one condition by the time you get an appointment you have a list of things you want to ask them if migraine is your main um, um condition um your doctor family doctors uh, similar to, to pharmacists, we didn't get a lot of education on migraine per se. We got headache in general, but they didn't give us that specific training on migraine. And this is something that family physicians, um, nurse practitioners, even neurologists, believe it or not, they don't get as much training on migraine versus other conditions. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to get really high-end consult, it's usually a headache specialist. And in Canada, not only in Canada, around the world, there's a, a, they're scarce. There's not a lot of them. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's not one of these conditions that a lot of people want to study more. Uh, it's it's and it's really important that um, we find or we try as pharmacists to be that first line of support, not only to the patient but also to the doctor. Because if the doctor is at is at their end, they would appreciate if someone knows a little bit more and give them a suggestion. They would go with it, and that's what we see with with the program that we're working with, which is we are seeing more and more acceptance to our recommendations because our recommendations are based on guidelines and the doctors want to help the patients, but they're out of ideas. Mm -hmm. And with us making these suggestions, we are also providing them with information and the opportunity to look up other options for the patients. So it's a great opportunity for pharmacists to get involved, for patients to get allies, because a doctor is, is more likely to listen to a, um, a suggestion from a pharmacist versus you going with saying, well, it says on Google, I, I read on the internet, I can get this. They're not going to be as accepting. So getting a, a pharmacist as your ally is a great way for us to start um, uh, supporting people living with migraine. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't realize that the pharmacist, the pharmacist can communicate directly with the physician. So we can have a 10 or 15 minute, I mean, or half hour consult with you. We can ask you, okay, what have you tried? What works? What doesn't work? We can drop kind of a whole plan and then send this off to the doctor. I mean, it doesn't happen instantly, but we can definitely advocate for you. And this is an avenue that I think that patients do not realize is there. So as pharmacists, we're one of the most accessible healthcare professionals. You can have a conversation with us and we can kind of give you the leg up before you even need to see your doctor, right? And I mean, your doctor might still want to see you and they still definitely have, have a role, but we can start that process. And that's what you're doing, Hava, with with the kind of work you're doing, right? Yes, and um, you you put it exactly right. What we do is we have the time as well mm -hmm. to also walk you through these options and tell you what each each and every option entails in terms of benefit versus risk. What are the side effects? Because success does not look the same for everybody. Just right. to reduce the number of migraine days is not everybody's um, aim. It's not. So I'm going to give you an example. One of the best medications to reduce number of migraine days is uh, Topiramate or Topamax. Mm -hmm. It's great. It's, it really is a good um, medication. However, one of the uh, side effects is brain fog. So you will need to have that discussion with the patient. Say, you might not get it, but it, it does exist. Mm -hmm. When you try it, if you find that it's really impairing you, and I'm going to say this now with a little bit of, like if it's a woman who has young children, can she really afford not to be fully, uh, you know, you know, fully there? If, if there's mm -hmm. brain fog, if you're really trying to be focused, you have a job and you have a yeah. baby. And, and you have a life and you need to drive the kids to school and you need to also do things around the house and you need to do your job. Can you afford to have that brain fog? And what does it look for you? And even if you want to try it, you can try it and then decide. But mm -hmm. we walk with you, we walk you through these um, different options and, and we talk about them. If someone has um, low blood pressure, then uh, we will not give them a blood pressure medication because the blood pressure might go lower. They are more at risk of having hypotension, falling, fainting. And, and again, it's something, but if they have high blood pressure, we will be able to spend that time to also tell you each and every one to explore a little bit um, the options with you. And when we send that recommendation, it's based on what would you like to try next? If you've tried already two, preventives. Your doctor has given you two. They didn't work for you or you weren't happy with them. Why? How long did you use them for? What side effects bothered you most? Do, do some of these side effects go away with time or do they continue or do they get worse? And the doctor decides to give you a higher dose. So you, I, I have had a, a patient saying she got worse and her migraine is much, much worse. And she said, well, the doctor prescribed a higher dose, even though I've been getting worse since I started this medication. So we also look at what possible side effects mm -hmm. could have contributed to you getting worse. Mm -hmm. 
What are the options? It, and the communication with the doctor. We can spend that time with you. You don't need an appointment and you don't need to pay us. So it's a resource. It's a free resource as you said, accessible, and we can give you the time to sit with you and also help you understand. So we advocate for you, but we also empower you to advocate for yourself, because if you go and you're prescribed something, you can have that discussion around, well, can I try this instead, because I'm worried about this side effect. And that empowers you. And when you are part of the decision making, then you're more likely to stick to it and you're more likely to actually be um, uh, more committed to making sure that, you know, you, you give it a fair try. And if it doesn't work, we go back and we, we have that discussion. How long you stick to a medication in general for a medication to be considered, you know, a trial, you need to take it for three months. Yeah. Can you take months when do you say no 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 i cannot continue or it's possible that uh, the, the dose was too high that if we reduce the dose and we continue a little bit longer then maybe you can tolerate it and then we can increase it again pharmacists can do this with you and they can do much more for you than what today is you're seeing and all it takes is for you to talk to your pharmacist and have that discussion we've had real great success stories with people living with migraine who came through uh, the migraine pharmacist and they um, you know we're part of well.ca migraine and the migraine pharmacy network canada where we are encouraging patients to go to their pharmacists and we are training pharmacists on how to best advise patients and what treatment options we update them on what's new and we encourage them to also offer that support to patients because sometimes they don't even know so how do you see if you see a patient if a pharmacist sees a patient is constantly um, you know refilling their tryptam they're not supposed to have more than 10 days a month, but they are using it more than that. That's, an, that's, that's a point of intervention to have that discussion with the patient and say, well, you are possibly going into medication overuse headache. Let me see how I can help you. And there are, even for that, there are different protocols and it depends on what the patient wants. How do they uh, how do they do better? Some people say, okay, I'm ready to go cold turkey. I'm going to stop it altogether and start... Um, and you or some say I cannot take the pain, then there are different protocols for these patients than those who say, well, I'm going to try cold turkey to just get off and stick to the 10 days. Mm -hmm. And you, you've touched, you've touched, sorry, go ahead, Heba. No, 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 ahead. no, I'm sorry. Well, no, you, you touched on something that I think is really, really important. It, what you're really talking about is patient-centered care. And you're talking about um, treating each patient right? Rather than just treating the condition. And as pharmacists, we also, we are not looking to just pile medication on you. We're looking to optimize your therapy. So you're already taking whatever it is to cope with the migraines that you're having, but maybe it's not ideal, or maybe you're taking too much of it and you're ending up with say these, um, they're not rebound headaches anymore, <laughs> you know, but these medication overuse headaches, right? And it's not because we think that you're addicted to the medication. Dependence is very, Physiological dependence is very different than addiction. Of course, they can kind of, you know, play both. It can kind of, yeah, be a little bit tough to distinguish sometimes, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about optimizing a therapy that works for you. So as you said, say a mother, she might not be able to, with young children, she might not be able to tolerate Topamax, but that's okay. We can talk about other treatments or we can talk about prophylaxis. We can, we can talk about different things. Why? Because we want you to be healthy and live a better quality life. That's what we're getting at here. Because I think a lot of times people think the pharmacists just want to pile medications on top of, you know, whatever else the person is already trying to do. That's not it. It's about optimizing therapy and it's about using the best available scientific evidence. And a uh, pharmacist, you're the second pharmacist I've had on the channel now that is really just specializing in this area because it is such a, 
a pain point for society. And there are patients who are suffering and they don't need to be suffering like this. And so, you know, pharmacists, we do have the knowledge and we do have the ability to e go deeper into this, right? And so using your pharmacist as, as an accessible resource, um, I think is is just essential. And, and the work that you're doing, I mean, I know that you, you're speaking so passionately because I spoke with you earlier and I know that you've seen this really change people's lives and have a positive impact. Yes, and it's it's it's. Uh, I I didn't feel um, as fulfilled in my career ever as I do um, uh, working with people with migraine. Wow, living with migraine are dismissed. They are they miss out on family occasions. They sometimes, especially when it's a woman who cannot even have a career or is worried about having a child or if it's an elderly who is isolated because of the headache and because of the um, also affordability. A lot of these medications are very expensive. The new yeah. medications, they're very expensive. A lot of these medications are not covered. The mm -hmm. government does not cover um, migraine um, abortive medications like triptans. Mm -hmm. You need have them depending on the province they're not it, it, some of these some of the provinces don't cover them so if if you're on a pension and you're just on the you know just a basic pension and your medication is a hundred dollars only for the abortive that's a lot of money for mm -hmm. people with uh, low income so when we start looking at options for them that are sustainable because obviously, you know, and these people, instead of taking their triptans, they cannot afford them. They end up taking more Tylenol and more Advil and, you know, lock themselves up and get even more isolated. And that's not fair. I, I, I love that you brought me back to quality of life because I call it success is different for each and every person. And that's sure. your of life what is it that you want to do do you want to go to your um you know niece's wedding or is it that you want to go to work or do you want to drop your kids to school or is it that you want to have a good night's sleep and not worry that you're going to wake up early in the morning with the biggest headache that you don't know what you're going to do like it's what is it that you want to do and quality of life is very important one of the things that we're missing in in migraine is that there's there are no tests you can't test, you can't measure as well. It's not like blood pressure, you put a cuff and I know that your blood pressure is high. Um, it, we don't have uh, even, um, there's, there's also that, that, that huge fear that my patients have of going to the emergency room. Can you imagine if you're photophobic and phonophobic, you can't hear and you can't see um, and, you know, bright lights and you cannot hear loud noises and you have to go sit for six hours in, in an emergency room. Can you imagine how how bad it is but then you can go and have a worse experience and people start telling you well you're not getting a narcotic mm -hmm. because they're thinking that you're drug seeking you're going there to tell them i have the biggest headache because of that like the if i can keep people in their homes comfortable and functional without disability with even the smallest changes have impact on people living with migraine. Lifestyle changes are great for people living with migraine. Things like um, when we start a medic, when when I see a patient for the first time, we do something called a hit six score, and that is six questions just to evaluate how well are they doing now. What is the impact that headaches have on their on their life now? And when we do recommend a medication and they come back for a follow up, we go back and visit that and see. And sometimes they say, oh, I'm, it's horrible. And then we go through these and they see by themselves that there are small changes that have happened and it encourages them to go forward. It's the same if you're a blood pressure, you're on a blood pressure medication and you take your blood pressure medication and then you, you, you know, you measure blood pressure and it's better, then you are encouraged to do more of what you're doing. And that is something we do with people living with migraine. Lifestyle changes, some of them might seem, um, you know, intuitive. Of course, you shouldn't be doing this, but maybe that encouragement is needed. The number one thing that you need to do if you want to manage your migraine is start a diary. Start a migraine diary. There's 
a million um, uh, apps out there to help you now. Do you, have also, a, do you have a favorite, Heba, that you like or that your patients like? Well, I, I, I usually have two, not one, because I, I, okay. I like to give them the option. The mm-hmm. Canadian Migraine Tracker is a great one. It's free and it's developed by the Canadian Headache Society and Migraine Canada. And it's, it's really nice. And because it's free as well, um, my patients really like it. Um, the other one that is very popular, 3 million people around the world are using it, is Migraine Buddy. And oh, this yeah. has a free version, but also has a paid version. It does have a feature that I really like, which is it tells you, it, it tends to give you a link. It, it identifies if there's a relationship between your migraine and changes in weather or barometric pressure. So I hear a lot of patients coming and saying, well, the weather has been horrible this month. I've had six migraine attacks this month. And they were horrible. They were very bad because there was a storm coming and, you know, different people different living in different places in Canada, they have different experiences. They, like we have higher prevalences, prevalence of migraine in certain provinces because of these changes, especially that happen during one day, they see all three um, seasons in, in one day. So yeah. there's these barometric uh, pressure and migraine body has that. And once you identify it, then we can also talk about different things that you can do. It doesn't need to all be medicine. As you said, me as a pharmacist, well, my success is with the least number of pills for you. Yes. Not piling, you know, a million of them. But we know that, for instance, in migraine, unlike a lot of medical conditions, um, supplementation is very important. Like we know that magnesium works. We know that vitamin B2 works. We know CoQ10 works as preventives. So if you don't want to be on a blood pressure medication, you're in the one to six. I have had a lot of patients where we started with lifestyle, a little bit of supplements. And I had a young woman tell me, this is the first time in my life that I have a period without a migraine and no cramping because, you know, magnesium works not only on migraine, but it also helps with, you know, menstrual cramps. Mm -hmm. And that means that we have actually helped her. These six days were her misery. And these six days, she is like she sent me an an email and again as I said this gives me like it's the most rewarding of everything that I've done and I've been a pharmacist for years and years and years I'm not going to say how many (laughs) and this is these are the small wins that we have every day with each and every person that we see and if and give them hope as well there's a lot of people saying well I have to live with it that's I have patients tell me that the doctor tell them, well, you just have to manage, take, you know, take your medication when it happens, we can't predict it. But if we say that if I know that there's going to be a change in the barometric pressure, and I know it's coming, I'm going to make sure that I hydrate, I'm going to sleep well, I'm going to exercise ahead of time. And I'm and all this, I don't know if if your other guest explained a threshold theory. I don't think so. So go ahead. With migraine, um, for you to have an attack, you need to reach a certain threshold. So it's like, a, I'm going to say it's a glass of water for it to spill. So you need to keep on adding things. So if you have red wine and you eat cheese that is aged cheese or go out and have Chinese with MSG mm-hmm. and they rest, and you add to that that you don't sleep well, you go to bed really late, Um, then you get closer and you're going to have that migraine. Okay. Now, of course, you have to be predisposed. So there's no blaming here that, you know, it's you who's causing your migraine. No, it's exactly the opposite. We know that you're close because there's going to be a storm coming or your period is coming. So your threshold is you're already that the glass is half full already. So for it to overflow, you possibly need to do more or not necessarily, but if you don't do these things, then your odds of having a migraine becomes less or even the severity becomes less. So we want you to be able to um, um, do these small, small steps that help you. So this is, this is why keeping a diary is important. Looking at the small changes that you can do. Um, we know, for instance, that people who um, um, live with migraine 
um, are more likely to to get better if they go on a protein rich diet and reduce their mm. sugar. Mm -hmm. So um, again, we don't know why. What we know is, of course, we know that blood sugar fluctuations can, you know, dipping and and yeah, increasing your sugar might actually uh, trigger a headache that can become a migraine. But um, we know that if they go on a keto diet, for instance, they get better. It doesn't last long though. So okay. it might last for a while. But in the meanwhile, if you go on keto and you start exercising, we know exercise is very important and losing weight is very, like if you're overweight and um, um, you know, uh, you're more likely to have migraine than if you are um, not overweight. So managing your weight, exercising, eating healthy, hydration, how many people have a headache because they're not drinking enough water mm -hmm. and not only water, but also making sure that your electrolytes are balanced, that you are also uh, in the middle of a migraine attack. You can try, try an electrolyte solution and see if that helps. A lot of it is trial and error. You said this in the beginning, even with medication, even with lifestyle, what works for you? Because we know sometimes migraine is worsened by exercise. Yes. I can't exercise, I need to lose weight. And um, you know, how am I gonna do it? Is it, uh, um, it, it maybe high impact migraine, um, um, exercise is what triggers your migraine. You can go for a walk every day. Small, small changes add up in your um, fight against uh, migraine. The other thing is um, photosensitivity, as I said, can be a trigger, but also, um, um, there's there are there's new technology with um, um, glasses. I don't know if you've heard about them, uh, Avulox. These are they, these were developed based on this study that was done that showed that people who are exposed to certain wavelengths get a migraine, and if they are exposed to green light at a certain wavelength, they they actually uh, feel better in the middle of a migraine. So a Canadian, interestingly, a Canadian doctor decided he had two daughters living with migraine and he decided to invest in this. He took this study and he commissioned uh, uh, someone to develop lenses that block the harmful waves and to actually let more of the good waves come through. And he has... Um, uh, he's doing clinical trials on this and they are seeing that people... Uh, if they take them, it prevents a migraine. And if they use them in the beginning of a migraine, it actually um, makes the migraine more tolerable. Very interesting. Again, does not work in 100%, but it could yeah. be small, small things that you add up that help you. And um, it's, it's you finding out what works for you and finding the best ally. I think a pharmacist is the best ally, uh, but I'm um, definitely... Bye. <laughs> bias because I'm a pharmacist um but um I'm again it's it's uh it's one of these conditions that uh needs not just one person to 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 try to suffer by themselves it needs the whole health care system to work with them mm -hmm. it's we're primary health we are right there in the big you know in the beginning of your journey um you can start here and we will be able to help you and and support you yeah and you know you're talking about different vitamins and supplements different lifestyle choices um medications and um maybe that can be, seem a little bit overwhelming to people but it's kind of a step-by-step process. And uh, I assume, do you have people use the migraine diary for just a few months time or, or generally how long or are they using this for? Do you see any resistance into using the, the migraine diary? Does it seem like work to people or, or are they, they fairly accepting? I think um, the number one reason why people don't keep a diary is because they feel nobody looks at it. Oh, okay. Okay. So interesting. The pharmacist is able to actually, because the, um, like the migraine, the Canadian migraine tracker mm -hmm. uh, can, can, can um, uh, generate a report. Mm -hmm. So when you go to your doctor, you can go and show him the number of days, you show him the intensity, and that will help you. So if you're able to utilize it, then you're more likely to actually um, stick to it. I have not had... 
and I've seen hundreds of patients. I have not had one patient come, come back and say, I don't want to keep a diary. Most of them say, oh, I started one, but I'm not good at keeping it. And you know what? I don't, I don't know if, if it helps me. But then when we explain that it's, uh, it's, it's a way for us to see um, what happens after we, we did the changes, after we made these changes, and after we gave you these recommendations, let's see what happens to the number and to the severity. And let's see how many times did you need to take, because sometimes they say, well, I still had my headache, but how many times did you end up taking an abortive medication? Mm -hmm. You're recording this. This might encourage you because the pharmacist or the doctor will be able to um, spot these changes and go back to you and say, well, there is an improvement or maybe there is um, you know, a decline. And we need to be able, as I said, we do the hit six, but also alongside the diary, you are quantifying. You're not just saying, I'm feeling, I, I feel horrible because nobody can act on it. But if you have a number, nobody can contest this and, and dismiss you and say, well, no, you shouldn't be feeling like this because we do have that also happening in uh, to a lot of people living with migraine where they're told well you shouldn't be having this or you shouldn't be having this side effect or and and the more prepared you are the more organized you are the easier it will be for you to communicate and it would be more um also um let's say um i don't know what to, i don't want to use the wrong word here but i say the doctor should be more receptive because mm -hmm. you're not there with with an emotional description of your condition you have actual facts you have numbers you have um, you are on top of it and that will should give you um that um attention that you need to your condition absolutely um and how about are people who suffer from migraine, especially if it goes untreated, are they more likely to suffer from, you said that women are more likely to suffer from stroke. Uh, are they more likely to suffer from other, other diseases or ailments, even, even depression? What do you know about this? So we know anxiety and depression are very common. And mm. we know that because number one, um, I'm gonna paint a picture. If you're a person living, not knowing, if you tomorrow can go to work right. or you don't know when an attack is coming. It, it never announces itself. And when it announces itself, if it's that five minute, it doesn't give you any time to plan your life. It's, it's, it's not something that is predictable. A lot of people live in the, in the fear of an attack hitting. Mm -hmm. um, there's also, so there is a lot of anxiety around migraine, around also people, uh, how many times do they have to say, after they've confirmed they're coming, they wake up with a bad headache, they say, well, I cannot show up to a family dinner or I cannot. Um, Christmas is the highest number I have patients reaching out because oh, they are really wow. stressed about missing out on family dinners. They are stressed about cooking. They are, they're so anxious that it actually ends up in a, in a bad headache. Um, when they go on vacation, they're, they, they, they're worried about going on vacation because that it's possible that they will have a migraine. So there's a lot of anxiety. We know there's a lot of, there are a lot of comorbidities that go with migraine. Um, of course, mood disorders is a big one. Um, if you are um, a, a person living with migraine, a high I have a lot of high-flying um, career women who end up on disability. So guess what? It, 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 mm. If you're depressed about you know, being isolated and, and not feeling that you're not able to do what you really want to do in life because of your condition, then obviously, um, you know, um, mood disorders is not, is not something that can be avoided sometimes. Um, it also is possible that um, depression makes your migraine worse. So if you're anxious and uh, if you have high anxiety, generalized anxiety disorder, the risk is higher for you to have migraine. So it's comorbidities more than um, risk. We don't know which one they coexist. Um, another big one is um, GI, is uh, irritable bowel syndrome or Crohn's disease or all these conditions uh, 
uh, that 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 there is a link. We know there's something called the gut brain axis. So there yeah. is a link that is physical, and uh, again, it's it's something that they have to then manage two conditions instead of one. Then guess what? There's even more anxiety. Mm-hmm. There's more possibility of having. Uh, generalized anxiety around your condition and that can turn if untreated there's also all these uh, other conditions I do have people uh, with panic disorders Um, we know that um, there are different types of migraine as well I don't know if if you talked again with your other guests but we're talking about vestibular migraine where there's a lot of dizziness associated with migraine. And a lot of times people get this, uh, you know, uh, they, they get misdiagnosed as sinusitis because there's a little bit of, you know, nasal discharge at the time of the migraine. So they get treated with an antibiotic or nasal spray, corticosteroid. And uh, there are allergies, of course, there's a lot of allergies, there's food intolerances that that might be contributing um, to, to migraine. There's a lot of, again, this, it, it can be almost the whole body can, can coexist with migraine and can be a comorbidity and makes it even more challenging for people living with migraine. As I said, when you go to the doctor and you have IBS or migraine, IBS might get more uh, the attention Attention. Mm -hmm. than your migraine because this is something you've had all your life and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's something you have to live with and we have to tend to other things. Mm -hmm. I interviewed someone uh, recently who was telling me that women are much more likely to help uh, say their husband, their children, even their pet before they will seek out help for themselves often, unless it's something that is um, life threatening. Right. And I think this is something that is so true for women that, uh, you know, if you go to the doctor and you have a certain diagnosis like IBS, well, let's focus on IBS. Why are you going to bother a healthcare professional, a busy healthcare professional with your headache issue? Right. And so we're, we're doing this interview to encourage people to reach out, uh, to someone like Heba, to your pharmacist, to an accessible healthcare professional who can assess your your situation and try to get you better healthcare. And like you said, improve your quality of life because it's definitely worth it. I mean, if, if someone could start working with you or someone like you now, they might not have the same experience this Christmas like they, that they had last Christmas, right? We can, we can definitely work on this and there's, and there's time to do it. And it's, and it's definitely, definitely worth it. Right. I, I love what you said about women, not intending. Yeah. I, you it's know, with the, the headache impact test. So the questions are, you know, how often are you feeling, uh, you know, too tired to do daily work all the time? How often are you not able to do to go to work or whatever all the time? And then there's one question also right at the end. How often have you felt fed up? And a lot of women go like sometimes <laughs> and I'm like, I would be fed up. Yeah. But they also become very resilient and they become even um, so for them to even reach the point where they need to go to the doctor, you know, they're in a lot of pain, you know, they're really suffering to go to emerge, they must be really, really not able to cope with this sometimes after seven days in a row with a headache, like mm-hmm. an, an intractable headache, a headache that doesn't go away. And that is so disabling that they they cannot take it anymore. And then they say, sometimes, and I, and I say, well, you can be fed up. You can be upset about it. It's, it's okay, because I would be. And if you've trained yourself not to be fed up, that's perfect, because this is the only way they can function as well. If they're yeah. fed up and they can't do anything about it, they possibly cannot function anymore. But they wait sometimes a long time. A lot of women wait years before they get a diagnosis or they not because they wait, because again, sometimes they're even dismissed. They're given just, they take something over the counter and they kind of bear it and and they just go on. And, and it's, it's, uh, but again, I I don't want to be bias to women here even the men who live with migraine i've met a lot of men and i've i've talked to a lot of men that um continue to smoke continue to drink 
continue to, you know, not eat healthy because they're on the road, they have to provide for their kids, they have to provide for their family, and they are on the go, 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 and they never have a weekend for themselves. It's a, it's this weekend headache or migraine that they push themselves throughout, men and women, not only mm -hmm. yep. but When they describe to me their life, I go like, so, you know, you provide for your family, you work real hard, and you don't want to disappoint work, and you don't want to... Um, but then you go home and the whole weekend, instead of enjoying it and seeing your friends and seeing your family and, and having a life, you're in a dark room for the whole weekend because that's your the only time that you allow yourself even to have a head. Like they've reached the point of that. And it's documented in, in, in clinical trials that there is this condition where people just push through and push through and push through until they totally collapse on the weekend. That is the time where they're supposed to recharge, feel better, you yeah. know, go to work the next, you know, on Monday feeling great. They have spent the whole weekend just in a, in a dark room. The, the stories I have, there's a lot of horror stories, but I also have beautiful stories about how small changes and talking to a pharmacist and going back to your doctor and working all together has actually given us great results and great impact on, on people's lives. And, and if this is, if there's one thing I want to say is don't give up. And if someone tells you there's nothing left to do, I'm going to challenge this. It could be, um, we have now devices, neuromodulation devices. Um, I know me and you, uh, Lindsay, at one point we were talking about uh, CBD, does it work or does it, does it not work? Or try, try different things. And what works for you might not work for someone else and what works for someone else might not work for you, but don't give up. You have a right to have a good quality of life and you have a right to, um, to be able to decide how you want to live that life and to fight for it. Mm -hmm. And I am one of these people who offer to be your ally here, to offer to be on your side in, in this fight. I'm very happy to help uh, people living with migraine. I, I, I'm, um, again, it's, it's something that uh, this knowledge that we are building um, is something that we want all pharmacists to have in primary care alongside uh, family physicians. It's not only us, uh, even family physicians need to start working more on helping people with uh, migraine, but it will not happen without us doing the work. We need to do the groundwork. We need to advocate. We need to be the best advocates. Patients and other healthcare professionals can all work together to give this condition, um, the attention it needs and the patients to, to, to actually have a better quality of life. Absolutely. I could not have said that better. And it is encouraging to see healthcare professionals like yourself to hear more and more about Migraine Canada and different entities that are really working to raise awareness about migraine and the fact that you do not have to keep suffering in silence with migraine. There are resources available. There is help available. And ultimately, this will help people get back to living their normal lives, to participating in those important family events, to, in, to enjoying their day-to-day life. And like I said, it's not about piling on, you know, medication after medication. There definitely is a knowledge gap. I remember when I went to pharmacy school, we didn't, we did not hear a lot about migraine. It was kind of like, well, if you have a headache, you can get an anti-inflammatory. Here's the anti-inflammatories. If you have a migraine, there's a tryptin or there's an ergo alkaloid. Those are the options. And it was kind of left at that. But Thankfully, we have a lot more knowledge now. We have treatment options. We know about prophylaxis and we know how to better address the issue of migraine. And, and you've really helped us understand more understand. about what those options are. And so thank you, Haba, for, for joining us today. Can you tell us a little bit about the work you do and, and where people can, can find you or can find some kind of help if they think that they might be, be ready to seek help for migraine? Um, uh, I currently practice in Ontario. Mm -hmm. I'm a licensed pharmacist in Ontario, and um, I work as part of the uh, Migraine Pharmacy Network. And um, 
the to find um, if you are in Ontario, obviously I can help you outside of Ontario. I know that you have had uh, other guests from other provinces that actually do the same work that we're doing um, to find more information or to book an appointment. You go to well.ca. Uh, backslash migraine or and um, it should take you to the booking uh, platform it's free of charge to patients we are able to fund this through um, uh, we, we are able to get this through donations and funding from uh, partners and that means that the patient does not have to pay mm -hmm. uh, I do it virtually so we do it over zoom and that means that you don't have to leave your 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 house um, and that is something else that uh, we found that that a lot of patients they because they don't know when they will have a migraine and yeah. they don't want to leave the house and they don't want to go to a place that is um, you know bright they 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 are in in their home um, you know with their um, with all their comfort uh, items um, migraine patients tend to if they're in pain they, they 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 need to probably draw the curtains they they need that comfort of home and having virtual care is a great great advancement that we're able to offer um, to them so you can go book an appointment uh, I have openings um, if you cannot find an opening you can definitely um uh, email the program. There is an email provided there. Email the program and just explain that none of these uh, times that are available suit you, and I will do my best to, um, uh, you know, help you. I also have a, a website, themigrainepharmacist.com, um, where I provide some information, and um, it's 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 pretty new. So um, <laughs> I I hope that you will go there, and also if you find that there is information that you'd like us to provide, um, go ahead and and send us an email. We would love to hear your feedback. Um, uh, we do a lot of events with Migraine Canada to educate. Um, it, Part of what we did this, uh, why we did this today is to encourage more pharmacists to do this. Mm -hmm. And also um, because I feel that the best way you, a patient can, um, can live with this condition is if they are more educated on it. So the more you educate yourself, the better you will be able to manage this condition. Um, some of the patients that I worked with uh, are, they know even more than their family doctor. They've researched, they are attending webinars, they're attending events, they are on support groups. So that's another thing. Support groups are a great source and mm -hmm. resource for people living with migraine. In Canada, we have um, Migraine Canada, which advocates and is um, um, one of the places where you can go to, to find resources and to find education. Uh, there are um, different Facebook groups. Uh, I work and I volunteer with the migraine, with the migraine um, Canadian Migraine Society. They have a Facebook group for people living with chronic migraine. Uh, oh, excellent! Yeah, in in Canada, and the resources that are available there. They have treatment guides. Um, you can ask the community a question if you have if you're feeling something that you don't know if this is normal or not normal or even sometimes I you know they ask questions like um, you know the new medications that are available out there the CGRPs are injectable some of them say well it hurts what do I do and you hear different people giving you their experience with with these medications um, it's it's very important for you to be a part of a community that also supports you. Um, talk to your family as well. Um, it a lot of most of my patients say that family is very understanding. Talk to your work as well. Um, talk to your colleagues and raise awareness about migraine. This is very misunderstood, um, and and even me myself. Um, feel that having talked to more and more people, I have become more aware of the challenges that people with migraine go through. And it's very important that you advocate for yourself and educate people around you uh, on migraine. Tell people. And um, it's only natural that you're going to miss out on, on events. 
sometimes people give up on you and stop inviting you because you've canceled so many times. They think, oh, they're never going to come. If you explain to them and you say, I would still like to be included, I will always do my best. But I want you to also support me when I cannot make it to an event because of my migraine. I want you to be on my side and, you know, um, help me, but don't exclude me because I will feel even more excluded and I will feel more um, alone in this condition and in, in fighting this condition. This this will this will help you be better. This will help you have a better quality of life. Um, so I don't know if I answered where you can find me. I think they can always um, reach out to you and mm -hmm. find me. <laughs> we will give, I think, some information in the description on how they can reach me by email and uh, the website and all of that. Yes, and you definitely did answer the question. And yes, we will put all of the links into the description of the video so you can reach out uh, in the form that you find most, most appropriate. Um, but thank you so much, Heba. I really think that migraine is something that we need to draw more and more attention of, onto. That's why uh, we're talking about it again on the channel and we'll talk about it more and more because it's a definite pain point for people. And it's something that uh, up until recently, I think that most people just did not know how to reach out or even what questions to ask, right? And so having that knowledge, having someone like you here today uh, helps us feel more confident. It helps us know where to look and it encourages us to, uh, to reach out and seek help. So thank you so much for joining us, Heba. I really appreciate your, your time and your knowledge and just your passion for, for really helping people. It's, it's definitely come through today, and I'm sure that the audience will be very appreciative uh, for the information you've shared. Thank you. Thank you again for the invitation, and I appreciate um, uh, you including me in, in this great initiative to educate people. Thank That's you. great. Thank you, Heba. Take care.